We have started a study in the book of Ephesians. We've had two teachings so far in Ephesians. So we are up to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Uh, Ephesians 1, verse 15. Ephesians 1, beginning at verse 15. Therefore, also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in that which is to come and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have taught us to include the reading aloud of your word as we gather together in your presence. And you're the reason that we're here Lord, we acknowledge that the book of Psalms, the book of Ephesians, meet the test of your word. They are scripture. God breathed. Lord, you have spoke them. You have preserved them. And we ask now that you being present by your spirit would explain this passage in a way that we can grasp. Give us that enlightenment, that illumination that is spoken of in this passage. And then grant us to manifest that power that raised you from the dead in the way that we live from day to day. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Today we're going to take two prayers that are found in the book of Ephesians. Uh, one is here in the first chapter. The other one is in the third chapter. And they just serve as reminders as what's important to our Heavenly Father. It's unusual when you have uh, prayers uh, recorded verbatim, but we have some. We have some long ones in Scripture. We have some short ones in Scripture. Think of all the prayers that have been prayed from Adam till now. I cannot even begin to grasp how many prayers have been prayed unto the Lord in that amount of time. But there's certainly just a handful of them that God says, I'm going to record that one. I'm going to preserve that one. I'm, I want my people to hear that kind of praying, to know what that kind of praying is all about in every generation. And we're up to that passage or one of those prayers in the book of Ephesians. So let's, when the, the Spirit of God uh, came upon the Apostle Paul, and he records here what he was praying for all the saints. It's not just the folks that were in Ephesus, but for all the saints. There's something that's dear to God's heart that he wants to become important to our heart. And there's something that he wants us to be able to pray for ourselves and to pray for others who know him. You know, prayer, uh, what breathing is to the natural man. In the natural, in the physical, you must breathe. It's just automatic. You don't even think about it. It is needed. It is necessary. You, you breathe. That's how you get by. That's how you get through the day. Sometimes you have to breathe more than at other times. 
You know, sometimes things are very peaceful and just a few shallow breaths, that's enough. Sometimes things get excitable and everything breaks loose and you've got to move fast. And after a while you're breathing. <gasps> but you have to breathe. So what, <clears throat> I may have to get a drink of water. I don't want to use that illustration anymore, do I? <clears throat> Uh, what breathing is for the natural man, excuse me just a minute. I'll remember not to use that illustration again. <laughs> Let's give it a try. What breathing is to the natural man, so prayer is to the spiritual man. We are taught as followers of Christ that we pray without ceasing. And we do, don't we? It's just, it's, it's part of being a follower of Christ. Started instantly. I mean, as soon as we were born again, we had this desire to get closer to the Lord, to talk things over with Him. We had probably been exposed to prayer, maybe men's kinds of prayer, maybe some basic types of prayer. I was exposed to prayer growing up because I was taught a little prayer by rote that I was supposed to uh, say when I went to sleep. Uh, there was a prayer that I was taught when, you know, just a little fella, and you're supposed to fold your hands before you eat that peanut butter sandwich, you know, and you're supposed to bow your head and there's, you say a little prayer. Okay, so we'd been exposed to prayer, but then we came to Christ. And now we really want to have conversations with the Lord. And prayer is a conversation. We share our hearts with the Lord. And then we always want to be listening because He shares His heart with us. We pray not to pass the time, but we pray for revelation. We pray for understanding. We pray for information. We pray, you know, we need some counsel. We really pray for an answer. We want to hear from the Lord. Sometimes uh, answers come quickly. Some things we pray about for decades. People say, how long do you pray about something? As long as the burden is there, you pray. When the Spirit of God lifts the burden, you don't have to pray about that any longer. Some things we pray once and that's it, never again. And literally there are some things that I have prayed about for decades. Generally that which is linked to eternity. Perhaps some of you have prayed for the salvation of some loved ones for decades. Why? Because the burden is still there. Having come to Christ, you want your whole family to come to Christ. Having come to Christ, you want all your friends to come to Christ. Having come to Christ, you want the neighbors and all the office to come to Christ. Jesus sure makes a difference. Paul prayed before he was saved. He was taught techniques of prayer. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisee. Uh, he, he was the top student of the top rabbi in all of Israel. He understood the theory of prayer, but after he came to Christ, he discovered who he was supposed to be holding a conversation with. And things really changed. If we skip back to the book of Acts chapter 9, we have this testimony of how Saul of Tarsus is born again, how he comes to Christ, how Jesus gets a hold of him. Now I know later as his name is, is changed and he uses Paul, okay, but Saul of Tarsus and of course Paul the Apostle are one in the same. And in the book of Acts in chapter 9, uh, I'm just going to read this as a narrative. You listen. It says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, and he asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, 
Why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? He recognized him as, his Lord, as Lord, but he didn't know who he was. Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. In other words, he was blind. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias? And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise, and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. As soon as he was converted, Paul entered in this special relationship with Jesus of prayer. And his prayer life is made mention of from this point on, the things that Jesus would share. Sometimes Jesus actually appeared in person to Paul and they had conversations. But Paul every day learned the importance of having a conversation with the Lord. He was praying. And he goes on and says, In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must must suffer for my name's sake. Verse 17, And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened, and then Saul spent some days with the disciples in Damascus. We see instantly as Paul was converted this desire now to have conversations with Jesus. He had heard about prayer. He had prayed what he considered was praying. And now he discovered the true objects of his prayer. You know, prayer is to have a conversation with Jesus. And not only to share your heart with him, but that he might share his heart with you. See a lot of praying going on here. You see a lot of visions going on. On here and I'll tell you just as it started this way is still the way Jesus is doing things today so we go back to the book of Ephesians in the book of Ephesians that verse 1 I mean chapter 1 verse 15 we read again Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Paul prayed for a lot of people. What's so great about prayer is prayer, Holy Spirit inspired prayer, is not bound by time and is not bound by location. You can pray in El Paso and God can touch somebody in Dallas. You can pray in El Paso and God can move in China. Uh, he can speak to hearts, he can change circumstances for folks in Australia. Boy, prayer is great. You see, uh, prayer goes as far as God goes. 
Holy Spirit inspired prayer goes as far as God goes. You cannot imagine the authority that you have in prayer when the Holy Spirit is in control. When you are in fellowship with Jesus, you are in Christ, and the Holy Spirit leads you in prayer, God is moving. It is the way God works. It's the way he works in your family. It's the way he works on your block. It's the way he works in the city of El Paso. It's the way he works among nations. It's the way he works internationally. It's the way he moves from generation to generation. Now remember, as we started this study last week, we said that the book of Ephesians is all about the saints of God possessing their possessions in Christ. And we had to remind ourselves that we are saints. Generally, if folks ask us if we're sinners, we'll agree. Yup, 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 that's me. But the Word of God boldly declares that we are saints. Those who are set aside for a holy purpose, who are filled with the Spirit of God, who are our ambassadors for Christ, who are witnesses for the Lord. Every man, woman, and child that is born again, indwelt by God's Holy Spirit, is declared to be a saint. There's just not a few saints, there's a whole bunch of saints. And you don't have to wait until you get to heaven to live like a saint. You can live like a saint today, right now. And prayer's a big part of that. Certainly there would be no way that you and I can live a sanctified life, a separated life for Jesus in our own power. We can't do that in the flesh. We can't do it in the world. And I promise the devil's not going to do it through you. The only way that's going to happen is that Christ is going to manifest his presence in and through you by his Holy Spirit. And so he had heard good things about what was going on in Ephesus. Remember in Ephesus, he got to minister for three years. He's the one who got to raise up the first leadership and to appoint them. A few years have passed now. He is in the prison system. He is actually in Rome. This is the first letter that he writes from prison. The Holy Spirit coming upon him. Tychicus is going to be the one who will carry this letter. He will carry another one to Colossae. But he will share what is going on in Paul's life. And he will also be able to report back when he goes back to Paul what's going on in Ephesus. How did they respond? Well, the word had come to him through believers who had been in Ephesus and now they were in Rome and they had glowing reports. And he blesses them and he thanks them. He encourages them. He says, he says, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints... In other words, all the saints were included in the body of Christ in Ephesus. That's not as easy as it sounds, folks. You know, you can pick your friends, but you're stuck with your relatives. And there are some saints, brothers and sisters in Christ, that may rub you the wrong way. It's amazing some of the people that Jesus will save. I mean, we are just shocked at some of the folks that he will save. People who are very different from us in many ways. And all of a sudden, we have these brothers and sisters in Christ, different backgrounds, different personalities, and we're learning how to be God's people. It says that they were manifesting God's love for all the saints. That is not an easy thing to do. There are some of the saints that are a lot easier to love than others. But it says at Ephesus, Christ's love was being shared with all the saints, those who were truly redeemed, who were born again. He says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And then he say, he tells them what he is praying for them, because what he prays for them, God wants for you. That's why it's listed. This is not just for the saints in Ephesus a long time ago. This is for God's saints in all of his congregations around this earth from generation to generation. Sometimes, uh, if you want to know how to pray for a congregation, you want to, want to know how to pray for somebody, and you don't really know, this is a good place to go to. And you can pray this verbatim. It says, 
He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. First he says, here's how you pray. Now who do we pray to? Literally, we pray to God the Father. I pray the same one. That, who was Jesus praying to in the garden? Who was Jesus praying to <laughs> on this earth? And well, you and I pray the same one. A lot of times you'll hear us say, Heavenly Father. You know, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We're, we're learning how to pray. We kind of know, well, you know, thanks for the sandwich and thanks for the shoes and sure would like a new car and hope grandma feels better. You know, we start off real basic in our praying, don't we? Just really, really basic. But then the more time you spend with Jesus in Christ, you discover that there's other ways to pray and other things to pray for. And you discover that there is one who lives within you who wants to lead in prayer. The Holy Spirit wants to take this lead in prayer, wants to, to prompt and to lay on a heart. How, how does that work? He says, he says, what I'm asking is that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And there's, there's a couple titles there for the Holy Spirit. Remember back in the book of Isaiah, that 11th chapter, there's seven titles that are given unto the, the Holy Spirit. Seven characteristics. One, and there's a couple of them that are listed here. Spirit of wisdom uh, and the, the spirit of revelation um, and, and the knowledge of him. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us illumination, gives us revelation. Every time we get together for Bible study, for worship time, generally we're inviting the Holy Spirit, would you please explain this in a way that I can understand? Now that's today's way of saying what's just been said. The Lord's got a little greater vocabulary than, than I have. Okay, but it's, we're saying the same thing. That may, may God give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. In other words, as you have these conversations with God, as you have your prayer times with God, may the Holy Spirit give you illumination, revelation. You know, every time we study the Word of God, we're asking the Holy Spirit to give us revelation, to explain it in a way that we understand, and then once we know the truth, we know what's on God's heart, we're asking for power by the Holy Spirit to live the Word of God. You know, when Paul mentions prayer, and he mentions it twice here, and he lists these little prayers, for those who are called to teach, and pastors are called to be teachers, and some folks are called to be teachers who aren't pastors, but for those who, who have the privilege to preach the Word of God, we are reminded it's not enough. To preach the Word of God, to teach the Word of God, to proclaim truth is not enough. People can hear sermon after sermon after sermon, have teaching after teaching after teaching, get handout after handout after handout, and it's not enough. They can get more and more and more and collect all of these Bible facts and all of this information and still live lost, still live like a baby. There must come a time, hearing truth is not enough. Hearing truth doesn't get the job done. Living truth gets the job done. Not to just hear the word, it's important to hear it, but we must live the word of God specifically by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to have to take this word and apply it personally to each saint's heart, all those who are in Christ. That's amazing to me. And he does it every time we get together. Every open heart here today, the Holy Spirit will take this word and speak directly to your heart. If, if you were to say, well, we're going to have a group of about 40 people and they're going to be scattered from ages 20 to 89. And you speak, pick your own topic, but be relevant to everybody. You want to take an assignment like that? How would you do that? The Holy Spirit does it constantly. There can be a group of 10,000. They can be from ages 5 to 100. 
And I promise you, every saint who is in Christ in that crowd, every open heart, the Holy Spirit can take that word and give illumination and revelation, meet that individual right where they're at spiritually and show them how to take the next step. Not only does he, he apply it to their situation, their circumstances, their life at that moment, but he gives them power to put it into practice. So we leave different than when we came in. Because God's spoken to our hearts. And that's what Paul prays for. He says, now I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will be moving in your midst. That that spirit of wisdom, that spirit of revelation, the Holy Spirit will be active in this manner in your midst. If he is, what can we expect? Verse 18 says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Revelation. You know, you can see things physically and you can see things spiritually. Paul, when he started his walk with the Lord, was blind physically. But the Lord had opened his eyes, his spiritual eyes. His, his, his eyes of, of his heart, of his spirit had been opened where he had been so zealous for God and he thought he was doing the right thing, but he was making a big mess out of things. When he comes to Christ for a three days, he's physically blind, but his eyes are opened. There is this spiritual revelation that takes place. You and I look for that revelation every time we gather in God's presence. It's why if you start off your day with a little bit of prayer, combine it with your Bible study, you get better results. A little bit goes a long way. Here's what you do. You, you want to be intentional and go before the Lord. But you, as you share your heart with Him, as you're reading the Word, you're counting on the Holy Spirit to be speaking to your heart, to give you revelation. We share our heart with the Lord, and God speaks to us by the Word, and we share our hearts with the Lord. You always want to leave time to be able to put into practice what God has taught you. Remember, just to know truth, to hear truth, is not going to get you anywhere. There must be an opportunity to live truth. And you're going to have to be empowered by the Holy Spirit for that to be a reality. And that takes place in our daily prayer times. You know, sometimes it's not conducive to be studying the Word, because you and I pray when we're driving, don't we? I mean, we pray all the time. In fact, if you're all by yourself and you're, you know, you're having a conversation with the Lord, you stop at a light and somebody, you know, is staring at you when you look, because you're just, you know, having a conversation and they realize there's nobody else in that car. So there are times that we are very intentional in our praying and we try and, and get all the other voices to go down. So it's a quiet time in God's presence. And then all during the day we're praying. Sometimes our mouth's moving, sometimes it's not. Somebody comes up to you at work and says, I got a question. Inside you're saying, Holy Spirit, help me now. Right? Yeah, I mean, right away. You don't drop down on your knees and start praying, but inside... I mean, you want help. You want guidance and direction. That's just the, that's part of being uh, in Christ. That's one of the privileges. You don't have to wait to Sunday. You don't have to wait to Easter. You don't have to wait to Christmas. Any minute of the day, you can get a hold of the Lord, and the Lord can get a hold of you. He prayed that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. I promise you that God is not going to give you any assignment that he does not have full provision for. The ministry he assigns to you, the jobs that he gives you on a daily basis, he already has the provision that is there. Don't say, I can't do this because I don't have this, I don't have that. He said, you need to go back to praying again. You need to ask me for something that you would know what is the hope of the calling and what, how, what God has to back that up. What are the riches of his glory that backs up what you're going to need to complete what he has called you to? 
You see, we're beginning to go from baby stages to a little more grown up stages in this kind of praying. And God likes this kind of praying. And if you've never prayed this way for yourself or for your friends, for your pastor, for your home congregation, then please start. Sometimes we ask folks, would you please pray for us? And they say, you know, who should I pray? What should I pray for? And if we give them these passages, this is the best kind of praying. I think they think, I'm going to get a list of names of sick folks. Okay? But this is the best kind of praying. And you can literally pray this verbatim. You can pray it right off the page to God because you know you're praying His will. That the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Now what kind of power do we have to draw on on a daily basis for the assignment we have been given? Because, see, you may say, this is too hard. This is too tough. Uh, you don't know the family that I'm a part of. You don't know the kind of office I work in. You don't know the neighborhood that I belong to. You don't understand the school that I go to. It's hard to live a separated life for Jesus. They give us a hard time. They call us names. They, they do all sorts of stuff. They, they put us, you know, we're on social media media and they call us all sorts of stuff you don't know how hard it is Jesus does what power is available to be successful in the call that God has placed he says that you may know the power and so you don't have to guess what power he's talking about he tells you what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in that which is to come. He says, the power I have for you to draw on every day is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Now, folks, that's going to get any assignment done that God gives you. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that you draw on. He says, and I'm praying that you'll wake up and you'll see that. He was talking to folks he congratulated for how successful they were in ministry, how they loved all the saints, the things that they were doing. And he says, I pray you'll keep on growing in the Lord, growing in your daily fellowship with Christ, that you would have this continuing illumination, revelation by the Holy Spirit on what God's will is. That you would understand that you're a part of something so much bigger. And that you would learn to draw on the power that God has set aside for you. Do you understand that the assignments that God gives you on a daily basis and, and from time to time the ministry that he assigns you to is humanly impossible for you to complete? God will deliberately give you an assignment that you cannot complete in your fleshly power. Deliberately. If you can do it without his help, you don't need him and you're not serving God. That's a cheap man-made invitation. But when you need him to come through each day... You see, we're all, we, we rely on the Lord... We depend upon the Lord. We're counting on the Lord. And he prayed for him. He says, I'm praying this for you. We pray this for folks who backslide, don't we? Folks probably prayed it for us if we did. Do you understand what being out of fellowship with God is? The old term backsliding is? Where people were so excited about Jesus and they were so active in Jesus and they couldn't wait for what the next thing was. And now oh, let me tell you what God did. And then you kind of watch that kind of fade and fade and fade. And pretty soon they started missing here and missing there and missing here and missing there. And then pretty soon, you know, you can't tell any difference between their lifestyle and a non-believer's lifestyle. How do you pray for those folks? This is what you pray. Lord, I pray this is what you'll do. 
in this believer's life. This one who has lost sight of who he was saved to be. Who he is in Christ. This one who's confused and in bondage to the enemy. That there is darkness. Let him be set free. That's part of Jesus' job description. He sets the captives free. When you and I get out of line, I'm glad somebody prayed for us. We pray for ourselves. We pray for others. It says he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Jesus wins. Jesus has broke the power of sin and death. Jesus is victorious. Jesus is Lord of the entire universe. Jesus is the righteous judge. All of this has been given unto him by God the Father. Don't live like you're on the losing side. You're on the winning side. We are not to live like we're in darkness and we don't know what's going on. We are to live in the light and God says, I'm telling you exactly what's going on and here's how you pray. Well, we got halfway through what we thought we were going to get through. We didn't get anywhere close to that second prayer. So I guess we'll just save that until we get to chapter 3. But we got through this first prayer at this time. You can take the word and you can pray it verbatim and you know you're praying the heart of God. You know you're praying the will of God for yourself. You know you're praying the will of God for brothers and sisters in Christ. You know you're praying the will of God for your home congregation. It is right to pray these scriptures back to the Lord. He loves to be reminded of his word. What he's really delighted in is that you discovered they were in there and you dared by faith to pray them back to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your encouragement. Sometimes, Lord, we don't know exactly what to pray, and then you remind us that there's certain things that it's always right to pray, and this is one of those passages. Lord, thank you for this privilege. Lord, we have this hunger, we have this desire to talk things over with you, and Lord, we know that we've not yet arrived, that there are better ways to pray, and we know it's important to make contact with you on a daily basis, and to be able to hear what you're saying unto us. Afresh, we put ourselves in your hands. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.